Okay, uh, well, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to the Guernsey Literary Festival. Uh, what is the last event of the day? What I believe has been christened Super Saturday. Uh, we've come to the end of that now. So I very much hope that you've been uh, enjoying the festival uh, this weekend and indeed over the last few weeks. Um, I'm sure you'll agree, you know, how, how lucky are we to, to be able to have a literary festival this year and to have um, events like this and get together in rooms like this. Uh, I'm sure it's something that we're not going to take for granted uh, ever again. Uh, my name's Adam. I'm uh, part of the team at the Gilule Library, uh, and I'm also part of the steering committee for the Literary Festival. Uh, and it's my pleasure to be hosting this event this afternoon, an event which is uh, kindly sponsored by The List. Um, so we're very grateful to them. Uh, it's a, a different kind of event to ones I've hosted before, with our guests joining us via video link. Uh, I'm sure the technology will uh, be kind to us, but if we do, you know, if we do have any connection. You know, if, if Joanne does freeze mid-sentence, you know, everyone try not to panic. Um, if I freeze mid-sentence, we might have bigger problems, but I'm sure uh, someone can pop up here and reboot me. Um, so the way this is going to work is uh, Joanne and I are going to have a chat for about 40-ish minutes, uh, and then we'll be opening out to questions from all of you. So if you do have a burning question for Joanne, do hang on to it, and you'll have an opportunity to put it to her at the end of the talk. I should say as well that this event is being live-streamed uh, it is being filmed, so I'll give a wave to, to everyone uh, watching on the live stream. Um, and those watching on the stream uh, will have the chance to join in with the Q&A at the end as well. Um, so they can do that through the chat. So uh, let me introduce our guest. I'm sure Joanne hardly needs an introduction, but uh, just so there's at least some justification for my being here. Um, Joanne Harris is the author of more than 20 books for adults and children. Uh, her 1999 novel, Chocolat, was a, a huge international hit and was turned into an equally successful film with uh, Juliette Binoche and Johnny Depp. Uh, Joanne has uh, gone on to write uh, a further three novels in the Chocolat series, most recently The Strawberry Thief, which came out in paperback not long ago. And she's also got, another, uh, got a new book uh, coming out in a few weeks' time called Honeycomb, which we'll be talking about in just a moment. She is also a prolific tweeter. Uh, and somehow, amongst all of that, finds time to be the chair of the Society of Authors. And she was also one of the judges uh, for this year's Write Stuff competition for the Guernsey Literary Festival. Just to finish off this portrait, um, in the About page on her website, it describes Joanne's hobbies as mooching, lounging, strutting, strumming, priest baiting, and quiet subversion of the system. And she also enjoys obfuscation, sleaze, rebellion, witchcraft, armed robbery, tea, and biscuits. So I don't know if we're... I, I, I don't know if we're going to be able to um, get through all of those things with Joanne today, uh, but we will do our best. Now, originally, Joanne was due to come here in person for the Guernsey Literary Festival last year, but obviously the pandemic put paid to that. Now, I'm told that the pandemic has uh, caused some disruption in other ways, uh, but obviously that is a very disappointing one. Um, but we are delighted that she can join us through the magic of technology this afternoon. However, having said that, I've just had a little voice in my ear to say that we have lost the connection with Joanne. <laughs> so not off to the best of starts. I'm sure it will uh, be restored in just a second. So I'm going to have to just continue talking to you now, I think, for a, for a while. So, um, OK, we've got her back. That was good. That was, that was quick. Um, all right. So. Without further ado, would you please join me in welcoming Joanne Harris? There we go. So it's so, lovely to be here. I was able to see you fleetingly and wonderfully through the first connection, but I can't see you now through Zoom. But you look like a great crowd, and I'm so happy to join you. So Joanne, you, you may not have heard me uh, introduce you there, but um, I was uh, reading the uh, on the about page of your, of your website, the list of your hobbies, which includes things like mooching and strumming and uh, sleaze and witchcraft. So yeah, we will uh, maybe get into, yeah, into not some of that. <laughs> um, so, but uh, where are you, Joanne? Are you, are you talking to us from your from your shed, your, the famous Joanne Harris shed? I am. I'm, I'm in my my shed in my garden in Huddersfield, where I've been for the past well, nearly eighteen months now. 
I'd be very familiar to anyone who follows you on, on Twitter. And is, is that where you do most of your writing from? It is now, yes. Um, I, when I'm, obviously, when I'm travelling, I'll write pretty much anywhere. But uh, otherwise, yes, it's a good place to be. It's, it's just muddy enough and just far enough away from the house for people to think twice about coming to interfere and to ask me to do things. So I, I want to start off by, um, by talking about your new book that's just about to come out, Honeycomb. Um, but just before we do that, just, just to ask, um, my first question is, is, how are you? Because uh, many people in the audience m might be aware um, that you've been undergoing some, some cancer treatment. Um, so I just wanted to ask, you know, how, how are you at the moment? How, how's that going? I'm just fine. Um, I think, you know, if I was going to have any kind of health in Buggerance, it was probably a good idea to have it during lockdown where I don't have to cancel lots of foreign events and I also don't have to do exhausting book tours. But, you know, I'm, I'm three quarters of the way through my treatment now and I'm hoping to be out of it by the end of June. And, um, yeah, it did, it's been okay. That's really good to hear. And I'm, I'm sure all of us here are, are wishing you um, the very best with that. But as I say, let's, um, let's start off by uh, talking about Honeycomb. So perhaps you could you could just tell us a little bit about that. That's as I mentioned, your new book that's coming out at the beginning of June. So, uh, what is Honeycomb all about, and how did it come about? Because there's quite an interesting story, sort of uh, an origin story for this book. Oh well, there's origin stories for everything. I I don't have hard copy of it yet, but this is this is a proof, and you'll see that on the cover of the proof, there is the phrase "There is a story the bees used to tell." Now, this is the first, and people kept saying, when are you going to collect them? When are you going to collect them? And I thought, well, you know what, I could actually do this. Because by the time I realised that I had over 100 of them, I also realised that I had the beginning of, of something else. And I thought, well, I don't want just to make it into a fantasy novel. I want to make it into a fairy book for adults. And I want it to be illustrated by somebody who is a renowned fairy painter who will understand when I say, I want this to be in the style of golden age illustrated fairy books. And so I contacted Charles Vess, who is one of the, the few living fairy painters we've got who actually believes in fairies. And I persuaded him to, to do the illustrations for it. And he's a wonderful, but rather slow illustrator. So we waited some time for him to finish his work, but I think you'll, you'll realize when you see the book that it was, it was worth it. These um, stories are these kind of fairy tales. Are they interconnected? You know, there's a kind of um, uh, a through line, a plot running through them about the Lacewing King. Is that right? Yes, it's a novel, but it's also a novel that is constructed in a particular way. So you have overarching themes and returning characters, and you also have stories that that don't look as if they are connected until you realise where they're connected and why. So some of them can be read alone and some of them are part of a kind of overarching theme. And I had the idea that, you know, people could could read it any way they liked. They could read it in a linear way or they could just dip into it and kind of expand the world until until they realised what it was that they were looking at, which is basically a, a kind of jigsaw puzzle made of stories. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a fascinating um, structure for the book and it's amazing imagination as well. I've been lucky enough to read a, a proof copy and, and it, it is a. It's a really beautiful book. It's, as you, as you say, it's beautifully illustrated and there's real um, kind of beauty in, and pleasure in the language as well. And it reminded me of, uh, of reading fairy tales as, as a child um, or having them read to me, except maybe quite a bit darker, some of them. Um, was that part of your intention then really? Was it to try and kind of recreate, replicate that sort of feeling and yet be you know, creating something new at the same time? It sort of was, because the fairy tales we're brought up on are ancient folklore and their past, they were part of an oral tradition and then they were generally written down by people much, much later, people like Grimm and Perrault and Anderson who retold these stories. And I thought, you know, folklore is an ongoing process. It doesn't have to be rooted in the past. We like the way folk tales are told. We, we are used to the, the style in which they're told, but we could tell different ones. And I thought, you know, I'm going to write some new folk tales, but use a kind of familiar nostalgic style. And it's partly because I was writing these stories on Twitter live without really knowing where they were going to go. Um, and Twitter had at the time a very strict character limit. It still has one, but it's, it's got a little bit more leeway now. And, and I, I started to write in this rather abbreviated way, 
which which sounds like fairy tales because I didn't have the the chance to have a lot of sub clauses and a lot of description in there. It had to be quite quite plain to fit in one tweet. And so it had a style that none of my other writing quite has, which I found interesting. And it was a very interesting discipline for me because I tend to be on the page when I've got the luxury of, of space. I tend to be quite wordy, but with story time, which was the hashtag I used for these stories, I wasn't able to do that. So I had to think really hard about the structure of a sentence and how it would flow. Um, and it had to stand alone too, because that's what tweets have to do. So you mentioned um, some uh, sort of famous uh, traditional fairy, tale, fa fairy tales there, like uh, Grimm's Fairy Tales and, and Charles Perrault. So w were these a big part of, of your childhood? Were these sorts of fairy tales a big, um, big thing for you as a child? So either thinking very hard about the answer to that, or <laughs> we may have lost the connection. How are we doing? Um, okay, well, what I can do while... Yes, I'm influenced. There she is. I'm there. I think we got you back, Joanne. Yeah, sorry, carry on. Yes, yeah, so those fairy tales were very much what I was brought up with as a child. Um, French fairy tales, German ones, European ones. We've got a very strong tradition of folklore and fairy tale. And I think a lot of our, you know, a lot of our literature is informed by it, whether we are aware of it or not, because they are part of the language, they're part of the collective consciousness of the literary world. I mentioned that um, some of them are very, uh, or seem to me to be very uh, dark. I mean, do you, do you we, we talk about sort of replicating that, that um, feeling from childhood. You know, is this book suitable for children? Are, are, are these stories suitable for children? What do you think? It depends on the child. Children are not all the same. Some of them might find some of them disturbing and some of them might not. I wasn't remotely disturbed by the very grimmest of Grimm's fairy tales as a child. But nowadays, we don't get to to show those fairy tales to children because they've often been Disneyfied and, and modified um because they're old and they had a different meaning and perhaps children are not ready for those meanings now um it's not it wasn't written for children but it wasn't written to exclude children either and so i think anybody anybody who would like to buy this book for a child would probably do well to read it first but you know i've performed some of these stories with my band with uh, groups of of children there and none of them have been traumatized but you know, each individual child has their needs and, you know, children can be upset by all sorts of things that adults might not necessarily anticipate, whereas other things that you might think were very upsetting, they, they don't mind at all. There's a story in there called Clockwork, which, uh, which is, I think, a very dark and nasty story. Um, and it was made into a little mini opera uh, where I wrote the libretto and I got a young composer in to write the music. And, and we did it as a sort of little flash mob performance in various parts of London. And it's the story of a clockmaker, um, a toy maker who, who basically remakes his wife. And he starts with her tongue because she nags him. And when he rips out her tongue, which is made of rubber and attached to, to these red ribbons and hurls it across the room, all the little children would just scream with laughter because they thought it was wonderful. And their mothers were standing there going, oh no, uh, because obviously they identified with the wife a bit more. Yeah, there's a, that's a great one. There's a, another story in the book that I love called The Teacher, um, which is about a teacher <laughs> whose uh, greatest joy was to sit and watch the children at play and mock them. And he says, uh, don't you realize that all your games are just make-believe? Why do you waste your time with games and fairy stories when science and reality have so much more to offer? Now, the sense is that the narrator and perhaps the author uh, don't agree with the premise behind that question. But is that, is that story based on, on anything or anyone in particular, or where did that come from? Well, I think, I think I wrote that one where a certain Mr. Dawkins was holding forth about how rubbish fairy tales were and how dangerous they were to children because they, they basically encouraged children to believe in things that weren't real. And then they would grow up to believe that, that you know, other things w were real. Yeah, and, and it was just, um, it was a little bit of a response to something that was trending on Twitter at the time, which, 
which often happened with story time. There, there are a lot of those stories. You can probably look at them and think, hmm, I wonder if that's political. I wonder if that is a comment on, on some drama that was going on in the world. Um, or you can just take them as they are. They don't have to have morals at all, although all of them do. That was a slightly leading question of mine because I had seen you that you'd written that it was uh, Richard Dawkins that inspired that. And I will say I'm a big, I'm a big, big fan of Richard Dawkins, but he does sometimes remind me of Professor Yaffle in, in Bagpuss, if anyone uh, is familiar with that, um, and particularly in that instance. But, but let me turn this back on you then, Joanne. So how would you answer that question? You know, what, what, what is the point of fairy, you know, in, it, what's the point of fairy tales and, and, and why do we need them in, in 2021? Well, I think that Richard Dawkins, though brilliant in many ways, has a very narrow vision. And I think that because he hasn't read enough fiction, he hasn't quite understood the nature of metaphor. Now, in a pre-Freudian society where there was no language to describe the unconscious or the world of dream or the things that come to us from outside of our immediate perception, it was very useful to have fairy tales because fairy tales are effectively the secret language of the human unconscious. Even 300, 400 years ago, people did not believe producers a lot of beautifully illustrated and embossed books for adults. But there was a time, uh, a time that we think of now as the golden age of illustration, because there was so much in that style. If you look up um, you know, people like Harry Clark, people like Edmond Dulac. The, these people were doing these wonderful illustrations and they were appearing in books that were, that were definitely not meant for children. They were, they were supposed to be beautiful objects that people had in their homes. And this was around, you know, the, the, the end of, uh, of, of the, 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 the 1800s, the beginning of the 1900s. And I wanted something like that, something like the books that, that I remembered as a child from my, my grandfather's house and from the library. Um, something that was a joy to have, as well as just words on a page. Um, and you, you've, you've not seen the full illustrations yet because the, the proof just has grayscale, black and white approximations of, of what they are, but the, the color plates are just phenomenal and the line drawings are just beautiful. And, and I think people, people forget how much they like pictures because we've lost this, this tradition of having illustrated books for adults. And we've, we've grown into the thought that pictures are just for children. They never were. There was a time when every single novel had illustrations and that was, that was normal. And, and I'd, I'd like to take us back to, to the fun of having illustrations. Some people can use them or not use them. Um, some people prefer just to concentrate on the text. Some people feel that gives a little more and I'm I'm a big fan of of taking stories into different dimensions and particularly these of stories because they are a certain kind of fairy tale folk tale these are particularly good at taking into other directions just before we uh, move on to talk about the strawberry thief uh, one one thing I noticed that this this book honeycomb is is actually not written by Joanne Harris but by Joanne M Harris uh, and I've seen that uh, some other um, books of yours are Joanne M. Harris. Um, is there a particular reason behind that? You know, was, was, what, what was the decision there? Is it a certain type, of, a certain kind of, of your books that you differentiate between the two? Yes, all my fantasy books are written as Joanne M. Harris. Um, it's the books that are published by Gollants, the ones that have actual overt fantasy elements rather than just hidden fantasy elements like my, my Ryan books. I, I tend to write them as John M. Harris. That way people will know. Some people really enjoy out and out fantasy and other people would rather it was kept kind of to the edges of a story. And it's just an easy way of being able to tell which it's going to be. <laughs> okay, so I'm turning our attention to The Strawberry Thief. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, this just came out in paperback and it's book four in the Chocolat series. Uh, which is obviously hugely loved by readers all over the world, including many in this room, I'm sure. So uh, what's the story in this one, Joan? What's the story in, in The Strawberry Thief? Well, it's, it's, I hesitate to call it a series and I hesitate to call it book four in anything, but it's certainly the fourth appearance of some of these characters who you met over 20 years now ago in, in Chocolat. And 
I've written them quite slowly because they have, I wanted those characters, the ones that you met in Chocolat, to have time to experience life and to change and to have life change them. And so, past for me, slightly less has passed for Fianna Roshi, but certainly near enough to that for her to be a different as an It's been a nice return where she started in Chocolat the place where she didn't think she was going to settle down. And in fact, she has settled down. Um, her eldest daughter, Anouk, is now in her 20s, has left home, is living in Paris. Um, her youngest daughter, Rosette, who has had all kinds of, of behavioural and social difficulties throughout her life, is now coming up to 16 and is living with her in her chocolate shop in Lanskine. She has become a person who fits. She's e made friends with Renaud, who was the, the priest in Chocolat, who's had quite a journey of his own and who is now almost a tolerable person and who is almost a friend. Yes. Um, and like all of my stories, it begins with the arrival of somebody in a village and, and a mystery, several mysteries, in fact. It, it begins with a death and an arrival. And the death is Narcisse, who is the, uh, the owner of the florist across the road. Um, he dies uh, quite old, leaving a number of unanswered questions. One, very surprisingly, he leaves some of his land to Rosette. It's a wood um, with a strawberry field in the middle of it. Um, he breaks up his uh, property to allow her to have this wood, much to the annoyance of his, his money-grubbing uh, daughter-in-law and son. Um, and one of the, the questions is, why has he done this? The second thing is he leaves the management of his will and his estate to Renaud, who he hates. He's never been a churchgoer. And he also leaves a written confession to Renaud. And he, knowing that Renaud will hate reading it because it, there'll be all sorts of rude stuff about the church in there because Narcisse didn't go to the church and, and didn't enjoy Renaud's company. But he also knows that Renaud will read it. And part of, of the story is, is the story of Narcisse and how he got to where he was. The third mystery is who is going to move into Narcisse's shop. And it is a woman who arrives very, in a very similar way to the way Vianna has arrived 20 years before. She opens a mysterious shop. Nobody quite knows what it is. And Vianne feels very threatened by this. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about what it is because... It's something that if you haven't read the book, I would like you to experience for the first time in whatever way you choose. But it's more or less a coming of age story for Vian, who finds herself in a very different position now, vis-a-vis -vis this newcomer, to the way she was 20 years ago, and who is having issues letting go of the idea that her children will one day be independent and will not need her in the way they do now. So it's, it's you know, if, if Chocolat was a story about a mother with a young child. This is a story about a mother with a grown-up child and how that feels and how sometimes letting go of children is, is not as easy as you think it's going to be. The, obviously the first book, Chocolat, is that's more than um, 20 years ago that, that that was published and there have been quite long intervals um, between these books. So when you write about Lonskine and these characters and that setting, um, what is that experience like of sort of coming back to them? Do you have any difficulty kind of getting back into uh, that space or, or is it sort of, is it very, is it second nature at this point? Is, it, is there a sort of homecoming feeling to it? No, it's, it's not difficult because it doesn't feel like going back. Um, if I were going back in time and trying to go back to a, plus, a past place and recreate it, then that would be a different thing. But I do feel that because I've taken such a long time between episodes here, I feel that, that we have been growing about at the same speed alongside each other. And we've been experiencing things, things together. And because Chocolat started off very much as a book about motherhood, motherhood is the thing that has informed the other stories. It's been, it's been Vianne was the, the mother of a, a, a six-year-old in Chocolat. Um, with the lollipop shoes, she was the mother of a child just about to, to go to school. Um, then she was the mother of an adolescent and a troubled eight or nine year old. And, and so basically what it is, is, is looking at formative 
moments in a mother's life and her relationship with her children and and finding the story in there so no it, it wasn't really it didn't really feel like going back at all it just felt like checking in yeah that's interesting it's interesting that you know the, um, the way that your kind of perspective on these characters and, and this place is, is changing uh, over time as well i mean as i say it is it's now more than 20 years since chocolat was published you you said in the guardian last year that you wrote it with you wrote chocolat originally with uh, little expectation of ever seeing it in print even though you'd you'd had two previous novels published at that point but that you'd been told that your style was neither commercial nor fashionable enough to succeed and that there was no market for books set in rural france filled with self-indulgent descriptions of food <laughs> now whoever told you that it's probably fair to say that they were wrong but I mean, thinking back on that time now, how, how did how did life change for you after Chocolat? Well, I gave up teaching and wrote full time. That's really the big change. Initially, my, my first two books were very different. One was a sort of gothic ghost story and the other one was a kind of gothic vampire novel. Um, the literary world does not like people who do different things. Um, I've always done different things. I still do different things. I've managed to get away with it because I've got a very loyal readership um, that tends to follow me wherever I go, but that's not normal. Um, at the time when Chocolat was written, um, there was a fashion for extremely stripped down, realistic writing. In fact, there was um, a little fad going uh, called the New Puritans, and it was it was a, a bunch of very young London writers who never used adjectives or descriptions of any sort, and that was supposed to be the way literature was going to go. Um, turned out that actually literature didn't go that way because I think people felt that that rather bleak writing was 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 a bit joyless, and because nobody was doing what I was doing, um, Shukara became a bit of a surprise success. But yeah, you know, I. It didn't change my life in the sense that it changed much around me. I, you know, I, I live in Yorkshire. It's, it's not the kind of place where getting another job makes much of a difference with the neighbours. But eh, it meant that I could give up teaching, which I'd been doing for 15 years, and I could actually write full time. It freed me up to do that. Because although it didn't, you know, it didn't give me money forever, it gave me enough in the bank to look at the next two or three years without too much worry and and to actually you know try and and do this thing that not all of us get to do writing full time and and being paid for it yeah that's really interesting so um can we expect more books with these characters and in this setting or you know is is, is that an open question at, at this point I don't know. I don't plan as far ahead as that. So I've written about one of these books every five or six years. So ask me again in five or six years and I might know a bit more. But uh, it's it's difficult to know what life is going to give you. And, and if life gives me another story, if it gives Vian another story or if it gives Anouk or Rosette another story, because I sense that you know those characters have also got stories to tell and, and something might happen to them, too, that 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 comes to me in another book, then maybe, maybe it will happen. I'm certainly not going to draw the line because every time I say something isn't going to happen, I always start planning how I could possibly prove myself a liar. So it's, it's, it's possible that there'll be, there'll be something else at some point. Well, we certainly love to have you back in five or six years to ask you again, although hopefully sooner than that as well. Um, I mentioned at the start, Joanne, I don't, you may not have heard it at the time, but I mentioned at the start that amongst many other things, you're a pretty prolific tweeter and we talked about how um, honeycomb kind of came uh, out of, of of stories that you were um publishing on twitter you have a very engaged audience on twitter so i wanted to ask you know how how important is twitter now to your life as a writer and also very importantly for me i really need some advice here how do you manage to stop it becoming a distraction i don't see the problem with distractions why would why would you not have distractions especially in a, a world where actually you're locked down, you're stuck in a shed for over a year, distractions are a really good thing. But also it's more than that. It's, it's, Twitter is not necessarily a place of entertainment, but it is a place of connection and communication. And I do think that writers need this. 
I certainly need it. Um, I wrote my first three books while I was teaching. I was surrounded by human interaction and stimulus and all of my writing came out of that and when I when I quit teaching I did from being surrounded by hundreds of people every day with unpredictable situations popping up around me all the time do you know what I'm going to be stuck at home what's going to happen um, and it was a real source of anxiety for a while and then I realized that touring and doing public events would mean that I would get a certain amount of, of that human contact. And the rest of it I got from social media. And because Twitter is one of those very reactive social medias. It's, you can have conversations there. You can talk to anybody you like. Um, you can reach out to people and, and ask for their advice about things and you can learn from them. Or, or, or if they're dull or mean, you can block them and never hear from them again. It's rather wonderful. But yes, I need a level of social stimulus like that. And so, you know, when I was a teacher, I used to work. Then I used to dip into the staff room, talk for two minutes, make a cup of tea, run off again, do some. Twitter has become my staff room. It's become my my water cooler. I don't tend to spend hours on there. But what does happen is, you know, I can I know that I can touch base in there and talk to the people that I know and like, but I may not see more than once a year even in normal circumstances so it keeps me connected and I think in terms of being a storyteller this is the one thing that I value most being connected and communicating with people I would not be happy just sitting in my shed all day with nothing but me that's great and um, distractions are good is definitely a, a line I'll be trotting out with my boss who is here somewhere um, so uh, thank you for that um, I also mentioned in my introduction that you are the chair of the Society of Authors which is a, a, a trade union for, for writers effectively um, can you tell us a bit about um, that position and, and you know what that involves well it's uh, it's a position in which you're voted I was part of the management committee which which are voted in by the members I was then voted chair of the management committee and what we do is we make um, decisions about policy, about supporting the members, about getting out of the society what the members would like to get out. We lobby parliament, uh, we, we look at copyright law, contract law. We try to provide social networks for writers outside London who often feel a bit left out. Um, we provide networking opportunities, lectures, um, legal support, all kinds of things really. It's, it's a trade union. We're quite active in favour of our members because actually authors don't make much money in spite of the, the legends surrounding a few very wealthy authors. Most authors will actually not earn more than £11,000 a year. This is the average earning for an author and so we are constantly trying to fight for authors' rights, for them to be paid fairly, uh, for them to be treated fairly by by publishers who don't always do this and we also try to warn them against some of the the awful sharks that have arrived in the publishing waters the vanity publishers disguised as hybrid publishers the the fake agents the, the people who are out there to try to exploit people's passions and their despair at not yet having found an entry into into big publishing and what's your sense for, from that position um, of how the pandemic has, has impacted on, on writers and on authors? I mean, it, it's obviously been disastrous for lots of creative and, and arts industries, but, but in particular for, for writers, and there has been something of a boom in publishing in, in, in some respects. So what, what, what's your feeling? Oh, publishing is doing fine. It's just the writers who have lost a lot of money. And, and this is usually the case. I mean, publishers themselves, I think, are racking up profits, but they're doing it by dropping a lot of their lesser known authors and taking on celebrity authors. And this is this is where the money has come from. In fact, a lot of authors have lost all their income over lockdown because you've got a lot of children's authors, particularly and people who who make most of their money through school visits, through public appearances. You know, all their income has dried up completely. And when you are only earning £11,000 a year and that drops out and you don't have a lot of savings, then you don't have um, much recourse, except that the, the SOA has got an emergency fund, which it 
turned into a COVID emergency fund. And we, we've given out, we, we gave out £1.3 million to authors last year. And we're expecting to, to give a fair bit out to authors this year too. And these are relatively small sums, really, just to, to keep people going and to stop them being made homeless. But there have been a number of donors who have been extremely generous to us and have helped us create this fund and keep it going. But I think, you know, it's been very, very tough for the creative industries generally. And a lot of people have had their books pulled by the publishers and so haven't had advances coming in and just haven't been making money in the way they normally would because lockdown means no face to face appearances, no school visits um, and in some cases nothing at all. And um, you touched on this already, but what, how has it been for, for you and your writing? I mean, we, you've talked a little bit about, you know, how it's affected your routine. And, but, but what about your, has it affected at all what you're interested in writing about, do you think? Well, um, no, not really. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a slightly different case. Um, I am not anxious about money right now. Um, I haven't felt that, you know, there was... Uh, there was a tremendous need to to do anything that I, I wouldn't normally have done. And so I know a lot of colleagues who have been so anxious about everything that they've just had writer's block and they haven't written anything at all for a year. Um, I am lucky in that that's not what my, my experience was. Also, because of where I live, I've got space. So I didn't feel trapped even during the, the strictest lockdown. Um, I was still able to work. In fact, I, I wrote a self-help book for other writers for those people who who felt actually that that the changed circumstances of the world meant that they might actually have time to write that book that they wanted to write and I thought you know if, if I can help them and bring something out as an ebook initially so that they can use it right now when they need it that might be a good thing and so I went with a small publisher because a lot of small publishers were feeling the squeeze and I wrote this book called 10 things about writing which uh, which came out in, in June of last year and um, been holding little seminars and things on YouTube for writers and taking requests for particular topics to cover because I think you know, people have felt creative but haven't known where to direct their creativity, which is, is a thing. I can, uh, I can thoroughly recommend those, those YouTube um, tutorials that you've been doing, they're fantastic. Um, okay, we're going to go to questions from the audience in a second, but one final one from me, which is a little bit off-piste, uh, but something that I'm interested to ask you for slightly self-involved reasons. Um, some people here might be aware that, that you uh, grew up speaking French as well as English. Um, uh, I think French was your uh, first language, actually. So um, this is something I'm interested in because my wife is French and we have a one-year-old at home who's uh, growing up with both French and English. So I just wondered you know, if you have any advice for me, Jan, from your experience as a... <laughs> As a bilingual child, um, what, would, what would you say? Well, I think all children are different and all circumstances are different. My mother didn't speak any English when she came to England and my father was an extremely good linguist. And so we spoke French at home until I went to school. I didn't speak any English at all, really. I picked it up at school and I think children learn by necessity. I think it's, it's, this is the thing. Um, I've, when I was a teacher, I always used to inherit the bilingual kids because I understood the experience of being bilingual. And it's not always a given that because you speak to a child in a language, they will speak back to you in that language. And sometimes the child chooses. And sometimes the choice can be a bit troubling for the adult because the adult feels a bit rejected. And I saw this a lot with, with because I taught in a boys' school, particularly boys tend to feel cut off if, if, if they feel different. I felt so different that there was, there, was no, there was no changing that because I was the little foreign girl who arrived at this school in Barnsley and nobody knew what I was saying. And so I picked up English very fast. But I think, you know, it's important for the parent not to feel under pressure to, to make a child bilingual and for the child not to feel under pressure to, to perform. If it comes naturally, then let it. And, and I'm all for it. I, I spoke French to my daughter when she was little. Even though, um, even though my husband isn't a great speaker of French, he just spoke English to her all the time. And so she learned both languages parallel um, and, and still speaks them both. But it's, it's, it's really very much about how you feel. And I, I'm, from some of the cases that I saw when I was a teacher, it looked as if 
The parents' desire to create a bilingual child meant that it stopped them bonding with the child in some ways. And that was that was sad, but it doesn't have to happen that way. It certainly didn't with, with any of my experiences. And that's great. I, do, I basically speak to my son in Frongley, so, um, but it sounds like that's a kind uh -huh. of... Yeah, should just go go with whatever it sounds like. So yeah, thank you for that. Okay, um, we are now going to turn this over to all of you. So does anybody have a question that they would like to ask Joanne? We've got some microphones um, coming. We've got a question just here. So if you just wait for the microphone, that will appear in your hand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm interested yeah, I can to know. See you again now. <laughs> I'm interested to know Joanne's perspective on the balance between discipline and inspiration when you sit down to write. <laughs> yes, inspiration is, is really not something you can control. Um, discipline is, although I'm not sure that, that either are particularly useful. I think really the thing that I have always tried to promote when I've talked to writers and, and would-be writers is joy. I think discipline sounds awfully joyless. And inspiration is pie in the sky a lot of the time. You might get inspiration, and that's wonderful. I, I get inspiration maybe three days a year. The rest of the time, I just clock in. Um, and if I didn't get joy during the rest of the time, then I wouldn't write anything. Because inspiration doesn't generally sustain for very long. And it's not something that you can, you can hope for, because it's a kind of magic. Um, but if you love what you do, then that does sustain, I think. And so I don't, I don't generally count the words that I've written every day. I don't generally time myself. But I also don't wait for inspiration to strike because otherwise, you know, I don't think I would have written half a book in the whole of my career. For that question, does anyone else have a question for Joanne? Got a, a, a sea of no hands at the moment. <laughs> Um, well, I can, I can, uh, I can ask a, a, a couple more of, of my questions, Jan, and we can maybe come back and see if, if anyone. Uh, sure, I know it's just intimidating just talking to a head. <laughs> yeah, so uh, did, there's something sort of vaguely Orwellian <laughs> about it. Well, but, <laughs> um, uh, but well, just on the subject of kind of advice, you know, writing advice, um, something that I've heard a few of the authors speak about at the festival so far is the importance of being a reader to being a writer. What, what's, what's your take on that? It's absolutely essential to be a reader. I do get a lot of, a lot of writers coming to me saying that they don't have time to read. Um, this to me is incomprehensible. It, it's like saying you want to be a doctor, but you're not, you don't have time to do any medical studies. It's, it's, it is part of the process. Understanding how writing works means reading other writers and as many of them as you possibly can in, in as many different genres, even the, the genres that you wouldn't necessarily choose for yourself, because to be a writer, you have to understand how writing works across as many parts of the spectrum as possible, nonfiction, fiction, adventure, fantasy, literary fiction, graphic novels, everything. Um, I also don't understand why, why people who don't enjoy reading would think that anybody would enjoy their writing. Because it's, it's like a chef who doesn't like food. <laughs> that's very good, yeah, that's a very good <laughs> analogy. Um, and is there such a thing as a, a typical writing day for you, Joanne? I know you're in your shed there. Um, and we say that's where you do most of your writing. Is, is, is there a kind of, do you have a routine or how does it work? Yeah. Uh, I do now. Have you got a In the last 20 book? odd years. Oh, sorry. Hang on, sorry. Sorry, carry on, Joanne. We, we lost you there for a second, but carry on. I, for 20 years, I've not had the chance to get much of a writing routine because I've been traveling so much. But now, over this last year, I have had a writing routine, and this is possibly why I've done so much work. Um, I tend to work best in the mornings, and so I, I will generally work in the morning, and, and around lunchtime, I'll probably stop. Around one or two o'clock, I'll, I'll usually stop because I'll run out of juice by then. But uh, I've usually done the best of my work by, by midday, at which point I'll, I'll do something else, or I might do something that's that's, you know, more more routine like editing or something like that. But I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer in stopping when you are ready to stop. 
rather than just putting in the hours because the hours don't care whether your writing's good or bad and there's no point putting an extra four hours in and finding out that you've written four hours worth of garbage because you might as well have been doing something else. That's good advice. We do have another question here. Um, I just wanted to ask you, have you got a favourite book um, and why? Um, a favourite book that I've written or a favourite book that uh, somebody else has written? No, that you've written. No, I don't. I don't really play favourites with books. They're so different. Um, and they're so much part of the time in which I wrote them and the things that were, were created within them. And there are things that I am, I'm particularly proud of and they are perhaps the things that were most difficult to write. So I wrote a book called Five Quarters of the Orange, which, which I think was quite emotionally challenging. And I wrote another one called Blue Eyed Boy, which was just hugely emotionally wrenching. And, and I'm quite proud of those two because they were really hard to write. And when I'd finished them, I thought, my God, I never want to write anything like that again, which is, which is a killer, of course, because I'm writing another one, right? Like, like absolutely right now, which is just like that. But, you know, it, it's, it's the way it goes. I think the, the amount of your soul that you put into a book is, is often one of the reasons you treasure them most. And you, you've uh, mentioned a couple of times that, uh, you know, we've touched on the fact that there's a real kind of diversity to, to your books as well is that is that something that you kind of consciously think about or is that just what naturally happens for you i would never do that if i could do anything different because the publishing industry hates diversity in that respect they love the idea that they can put an author into a box and they will know exactly what that author will write year in year out this never happens to me i'm sure my publishers find it very frustrating and i'm sure if i'd been able to to write differently and become a brand, they would have been much happier and I would have made much more money. It's just not the way I function. That's all. I, I tell whatever stories need to be told at the time and, and, and that's it. Okay, we've got another question for you here, John. Yes. Um, why do you like the sense of the mysterious, the enchantment, the witchcraft? Is it to do with the power of the feminine or more of a storybook idea? I like folklore in all its forms and magic is so much part of our folklore, our European folklore. I also like looking at what people believe and what people have believed over the centuries. And I've, you know, I have a theory that the line between magic and superstition and faith is a pretty thin one and it's all about time. I think people are, are motivated by what they believe and what they have believed. And because I'm interested in people and all my stories are, are based around people, then, you know, this is one of the threads that, that informs a lot of my writing. Um, I don't think of it as being especially feminine, although I think a certain tradition of thinking tends to think it is. Um, obviously, I've tapped into some of that folklore, but that's, that's not all it is. It's entirely about feelings and beliefs and and how we affect the world around us and how other people affect the world around us i was talking a little bit before about this but when we look at the language of magic and i use it a lot and some in my fantasy books it's it's the kind of magic that can be based in in spells or inherent powers but in the real world if you like the words that surround magic are all about charm enchantment glamour now what are those things those are human attributes and some people have them in greater capacity than others now everybody knows somebody like this someone who has charm now, what does that really mean it doesn't mean that they've taken magic beans or anything it means that they have the ability to walk into a room and it doesn't really matter what they look like but somehow they do something to the air and people are attracted to them and it's that kind of magic that I like to, to look at in my, in my books like The Strawberry Thief, this, this magic that actually all of us have, potentially. And it's about how we present ourselves to the world and how we make ourselves appear to people and how we change what is around us by this, this, this quality that we all have and some people use rather better than others. And so this is why I write about it so much, because it's this, this kind of intangible thing which has nothing to do with the supernatural and yet in folkloric terms has always been linked to 
spells of some sort. Because the line between what's magic and what's real is always shifting. And as we get to be a more educated, more advanced society, we tend to reject the superstition part, but we still have the belief part uh, because we still have the human part. That's fascinating. Thank you for that question. We've got another question at the back there. Uh, do you do you do a big whack of research at the beginning or do you research as you go along or do you not research at all? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think I do research at all, if, if not in any kind of formal way, because in a sense, I have been researching the things that I write about for the whole of my life. I've been interested in myths and legends and folklore and fairy tales for the whole of my life. And I will do the odd bit of research if I need something very specific. Um, for instance, if I need something specific about chocolate making or different kinds of cacao beans or exactly what was playing at the cinemas at a particular time if I'm writing about a book set in the 80s. But otherwise, I, those are little bits of targeted research. They're not formal research. I don't go and shut myself away in the shed for six months and, and research the 16th century. Because usually if I write about the 16th century, it's because you know, I've studied it already and there's something that I want to, there's a story I want to tell about that. Thank you. And thank you for that question. We've got another one at the back on the other side. C carrying on from that, um, your own experience, your going through cancer treatment. Can we expect a book about that? With a bit of magic? I don't think so. Oh, please. I, I don't think so, because, you know, it, it's it's not a special thing. One in four people get cancer. It, it's, it's, it is neither a special nor mysterious nor magical thing. I think most of what I have to say about that is being said on social media and on my, my YouTube channel. But the idea of writing a cancer memoir just makes me want to, you know, die already. So it's not going to happen, either of them. <laughs> but you write about being a mother, and that's done by lots of women all over the world. It could, it I could do, but do you with a cancer book with a bit of knowing. magic. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I will. I mean, of course, I did say before that every time I, I say I won't do something, I, I always do it. But I don't see that one as being a priority right now. But... Uh, but, you know, you, you want to hear about me saying goodbye to Mr. C. Um, I do that all the time on Twitter and also on my YouTube. And, and, and I, I do think it's quite important to talk about it because there is so much hoodoo about cancer and, and you know, not saying the C word and, and you know, not making these things public. Um, it, it's, it's very stressful for people. And I, I think, you know, I've had a lot of people who follow me on Twitter or who get my newsletter who have said, actually, you know, you made me go and have a routine uh, a routine mammogram um, or you made me feel less worried about my prognosis and this is a good thing i think if, if people who are who have any kind of platform will occasionally share experiences that's good but as as for writing a misery memoir i don't think that's going to be me we've probably got time for one more question if there's if there is one more for joanne um yes just here in the middle we've got a question just wait for that Microphone. Okay, nearly there. <laughs> Thanks, Joan. Um, I think you said that you're fortunate to have a really loyal readership, and I just wondered how important feedback from your readers is and how you go about engaging with your readers. Well, mostly, um, social media is where I talk to my readers. I'm not sure I'd call it feedback exactly. I like it when people say that they've liked something but it doesn't feed back if you see what i mean because when somebody has read something it's too late for me to do anything about it if they didn't like it i mean of course i love i love it when um, when people say that something jibed with them or, or connected with them and and i love talking to people on twitter and i will pretty much talk to anybody unless they're they're rude on twitter and it's nice to have a dialogue um, and I do enjoy the, the communicative aspect of this and, and the, the fact that nowadays we can talk to anybody and, uh, and we don't have to any of us be in ivory towers if we don't want to. Brilliant. Um, well, that brings us to the end of our time this afternoon. Um, so just to say that Joanne's books are available um, at the back of the room, so do stick around. 
Um, but all that's left for me to say is a few thank yous. And thank you again to The List for uh, sponsoring this event. Thank you to all of you for coming. I hope you've enjoyed uh, yourselves. I certainly have. Uh, and above all, of course, a very big thank you to Joanne Harris for such a wonderful and inspiring conversation with us today. So please join me in saying a big thank you to Joanne. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. I only, I only hope I can do it next time face to face. the Guernsey Literary Festival. I just want to say a massive thank you to you and also to Adam for chairing the talk tonight, which sadly concludes our events this weekend. When we were planning this year's festival, we were unsure of how popular this hybrid festival might be, but we've been really bowled over by the support of the public, our supporters and our sponsors. And we do feel really privileged to all be here in a room together holding live events. Joanne spoke earlier about the importance of being connected and communicating with people. And when we sat down as a team and put together this festival, this was one of the key reasons we wanted to, to be able to put on a festival if we could this year. It's actually our 10th anniversary of launching the festival, so we're really delighted to have been able to celebrate this milestone with you, as well as to be able to celebrate the joy, magic, uh, the joy and magic of books and also um, some fantastic stories um, and some fantastic writers. We've had a real privilege of being able to hear from some, some wonderful authors, um, including Joanne tonight. So thank you very much, Joanne. Thank you for everyone for coming. Thank you.